Bob Peterson is the writer, director, and creator behind Forky Asks a Question, which just scored an Emmy nomination for Best Short Form Animation for the episode What is Love? I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby, here with Bob. Um, So Bob, this is your first Emmy nomination. Take us back to that day of hearing the good news of getting that recognition from your peers. Well, it was a great day. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we were out there, the nomination was out there, I was working on other things. And then uh, I woke up one morning and read about it and jumped out of bed and called my producer, Mark Nielsen. And uh, just, it just was a great day. And it's, I think it's just fun that uh, my team gets recognized uh, for this, for this short. So I was very happy. Yeah, well, so let's let's go back to the beginning here. How did Forky Ask the Question actually come together? Was it after the release of Toy Story 4 and just seeing the popularity of Forky? What was the origin? It was actually a lot earlier. It was uh, four or five months before uh, Toy Story 4 was even finished. And uh, I had been working on other things. And then uh, I noticed that this Forky character in the screenings we were having internally was pretty funny. And it's Tony Hale and and... The, the idea that this character was brand new to the world and that gave him license to either be very naive or have this strange wisdom that was inborn. I thought, uh, boy, that'd be, that'd be an interesting character to, uh, to keep going with. And so I sat down and wrote a, a kind of a five little spec scripts that I pitched at Pixar and at Disney Plus. And a part of that process was figuring out what questions would Forky ask and then who, who would he ask them to? And uh, so I, I drove it a lot by who I wanted from Toy Story, the Toy Story universe to interact with this goofy utensil. And that kind of drove what questions he asked. Well, so let's talk about this episode that you're nominated for. What is love? Um, first of all, having that incredible voice cast, uh, Carl Reiner, Mel Brooks, Carol Burnett, Betty White. Um, they're all in Toy Story 4, of course, and they're all reprising their roles here. What was it like working with those legends? Was it, was it actually, was it the four of them together or was it just individually recording? How did that all work? Well, we recorded them individually and uh, over two days and didn't have long with each one, maybe uh, half an hour or an hour to get what we needed. Um, and so we would go in for a Toy Story 4 um, recording session and then I would step in and say uh, can I have another half an hour uh, and and but I tell you I grew up with these <laughs> these legends they're absolute legends and when I heard they were in Toy Story 4 I was jealous I was furious that I wasn't getting to work with them and so the first <laughs> in a nice way but uh, uh, the first thing I did was think about how I could use them in Forky Asks a Question. And because they are seniors, they would know something about life. And so I thought, well, what about love as their thing? And having grown up with Carol Burnett, Carol Burnett's show where she would do these sort of melodramatic satires of Gone with the Wind or whatever, I thought that might be a good framework. And then um, but just working with them, I, once I get over my my terrified nerves of being right next to these legends. It was just so much fun. Um, Carol, uh, they're all, they all have this great work ethic from the 50s and 60s. And Carol was regal and, and just came in dressed to the nines and lovely. And, uh, and then we got going. I, I stood next to her, very nervous, and talked about what I wanted. And then she just went right into the Carol Burnett of my youth in the 70s and just was silly and goofy and funny and smart and uh, Mel Brooks was everything I expected he came in he was ready to go you know such energy uh, I could have just sat there and let him direct because he, he's such a force of nature and uh, and then Betty White was lovely and these these are people that are in their late 90s you know and Betty they all have it they're all great and they all are really with it and um, I knew that I wanted her to sort of be a little bit more explosive because that's the Betty White I know, just super nice, but then we'll jump on with something uh, subversive or whatever. And so, but then uh, Carl Reiner, we recorded in his house and uh, in the same room that uh, Seinfeld had uh, visited him in Mel Brooks. And so he sat in his favorite chair 
And uh, I sat across from him in his other favorite chair and our sound crew set up. And uh, I looked over and there's a picture of Rob Reiner over there, you know, when he's 14. And, and what a great, gentle soul, extremely funny. Uh, he wanted us to stay afterwards and, and show us the things he had worked on. And I'm sure he would have invited us for dinner if we didn't have to go back and record Betty. But he told us stories from World War II of going, uh, instead of going to Okinawa, he, would go, he went on tour with Betty White to entertain the troops during World War II. And that was all orchestrated by a guy named uh, Captain Ludden, who then later went on to uh, work on uh, to tell the truth as its host and then married Betty White. Anyway, there's all these amazing stories. So I felt like this was very um, precious cargo. And I, I just wanted to make sure that whatever we did with these legends uh, ended up uh, uh, entertaining. Yeah, and I think you succeeded in that. Um, <laughs> and what's fun about this episode is that it really does kind of get at the the messiness of love sometimes where, yeah. you know, everyone loves someone different. There's unrequited love. Um, what What is your kind of overall message for what is love? Uh, I don't know that I went into it with a message other than love can be messy. Uh, but it's it's worth it, and um, you know I I I think you know Forky this this happened before Forky met uh, um, his girlfriend the knife knifey or uh, uh, Carol Beverly I forget her name but and so I, I want to think that maybe Forky learned a few things from from this he started off thinking love was was boring and and uh and then hopefully by the end of this he realized love is is sometimes messy but worth it <laughs> really it was just an excuse to have this have fun and and uh, have, have sort of this melodramatic almost soap opera like satire that carol burnett used to do uh i also made sure we got a little bit of the carol burnett um tarzan yell in there if you if you listen carefully and that's one thing she used to do all the time was that Tarzan yell? That was that was a very nice touch. Yes, for 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 more of the older adults, maybe in the yes, audience. I knew the older adults would be like, "What? Wait, what was that? I I, I, mean, right. I remember that." <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure if it was you or the studio who was deciding to submit this episode in particular, but um, maybe you've already touched on this a little. But what was sort of the process of selecting? what is love as kind of the best representation for, for, for if you ask the question. Yeah, I think it just held such a special place in my heart. Um, I mean, Tony Hale is fantastic in all of them, I think. Uh, he's been a favorite of mine for years. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, the What is a Friend episode was, was one we really considered with, where uh, Forky's talking to the cup and says what no and all that. But uh, I just feel that one's uh, the What is Love episode is the most fleshed out. It's the most silly with a bit of pathos. You know, you do feel sorry for Carl Reiner Osiris a little bit for, for unrequited love. But uh, I thought it was the one that sort of was the richest of the bunch. And so that's why we put it in. And uh, speaking of decisions, I'm also curious about your decision making process as far as like what characters that Forky would interact with in each episode, you know, which theme you thought would fit which character, all, all of that. Yeah, that was really a fun process. And um, I just went through and thought, who would I want to spend a, a bit more time with? Because sometimes the cast is getting so big that some of these characters will kind of lean in and out and won't have too much to do in, in these movies. And so uh, that was one consideration. Uh, I, I also like the idea of characters that kind of hit the cutting room floor that weren't included um, in our What is a Pet episode. Um, Rhythmic Tickles had not been in uh, Toy Story 4, was supposed to be, but the rumor was that that uh, person was eaten by a cat. And so uh, that was one thing I wanted to do was bring rhythmic tickles uh, forward as somebody that we had never met before. But it was basically, who am I entertained with? I'm always entertained by Dolly. I'm always entertained by Rex. Um, you know, who, who deserves a bit more time with us? 
and I always loved um, Prickle Pants, just just the master thespian. I thought he would be a good foil for Forky, who's kind of you know a little bit dorky, Forky dorky, and uh, so I thought that would be great. But it was a little bit of an organic process. Who would I want? And then what kind of questions would would go well with them? And I wanted to keep it as simple as possible, uh, but as basic as possible, just to let character come out. So I kept the, the sets very simple and the questions very simple, time, love. And then we threw in one which with Jess Bizarre, the cheese one uh, was just weird. And, um, you know, but uh, I think Forky gives you a little bit of a license to uh, be a little bit strange and weird. Uh, and so I was happy to oblige him. Yeah, you're right. There's so much potential with with all of these characters that you get to explore here. Um, and I imagine with Forky, it's such a fun character to write for, I imagine, because you can easily kind of mold him into all these different situations. Um, do you have any kind of unwritten rules or anything like that about trying to keep his personality somewhat consistent to where we kind of understand where he would react to something? Or do you just I mean, do you not want us to know how he would react and have it be more unpredictable? It's a little of both. Like even in Toy Story 4, someone talked about uh, the name of a merry-go-round and he came up with, you mean carousel? And so that somehow he knew a better vocabulary word, even though he had just been born and really shouldn't know that. Um, and so I embraced that. And um, yeah, I, I like the idea of the unpredictable Forky. Uh, and I, I also like the fact that he is, um, again, just been born and there's a, there's a little bit of us feeling, uh, feeling for that, the feeling for the idea that he doesn't know anything uh, in the world. But um, in this, in Forky Asked a Question, I kind of took him to a place where uh, he just kept asking things and then veering off, asking things and veering off. And we really, he doesn't really learn, we don't learn anything. But the, the fun is him uh, grabbing on in a fun way to some little crumb that he's been fed that, that he then takes and runs with. And so if there was any rule, it was pretty much that, that at some point we we're gonna take a left-hand turn away from the subject matter because of Forky's attention span. And uh, Forky's, um, everything's new, so the smallest of words could set him off and go in a different direction. Like, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the episode in um, uh, in computer. Uh, he he said something about uh, wow, that's so fun to say. And he, oh no, it was in leader. That's so fun to say uh, because Dolly had said that's the way the cookie crumbles, and that he latched onto that and wouldn't let that go and ran with that. So that was pretty much the the idea there that this was never meant to be super educational, but it was meant to be the fun of a character kind of taking this left-hand turn throughout. Yeah. Um, and you have been working for Pixar since all the way back to the first Toy Story, and you've seen this company just grow and grow and grow. Um, and I imagine you've seen a lot of change in that time. Can you talk about just uh, how it's maybe changed and how it maybe has stayed the same, Pixar? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of both. I mean, you know, when I was there working on the first Toy Story and animated on that a, a few shots. I did a lot of layout, but I mainly worked on Sid, the kid next door, uh, because I come from a technical background and I could do it. But the pioneering spirit at the beginning was the, the, the thing that ruled the day. Can we do this? Can we do the first CG film? Can it be good? Can we band together, not really knowing what we we're doing at all, and and make this thing memorable? And so that's what kind of uh, that first from like ninety, you know, ninety four, ninety five, ninety six. That that's what that was. And then then it's can we do it again with Bugs Life? And can we bring in a different director with Monsters Inc. and and another one with Finding Nemo and keep this going? Uh, it was a smaller crew. I think the big first main. Uh, step was joining up with with Disney and they really uh, let us do our thing as did Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was great at weighing in but he would just kind of let us do our thing as we went and so there wasn't really a big change once we joined up with Disney and in fact it was 
uh, some, some great eyes uh, on our work to sort of help us because you get lost in the woods in these things. You know, and in the recent changes, I think we're, we're more embracing uh, all the voices at Pixar in, in, a, in a great way. And um, people from all backgrounds are now, I think, coming in and telling their stories, which I think is a great welcome change uh, for us. So, but that pioneering spirit, it's like each movie has its own little version of that. Can we do it? Is it gonna be good? And it's never good until you workshop it forever and ever and ever. And then you eventually get it serviceable and, and hopefully uh, entertaining and funny as it comes out. But each one of those, there's a component of, we don't know if this is gonna work. We don't know if we can get it done. And so that you dig deep for that pioneering spirit to come back and, and, uh, and get it done. Yeah, that fun and that creativity and that little bit of heartbreak. <laughs> That's always great yeah. with Pixar films. Um, <laughs> I'm also very curious about uh, Monsters at Work, which is a series coming to Disney Plus next year. That's kind of a spinoff of Monsters, Inc. And for those who may not know in the audience, you are the voice of Roz. And you <laughs> are expected to be... Thank you. <laughs> and you are expecting to be reprising your role there. Uh, is there anything you could tell us about that project? Uh, it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's just a new take on, on that world, on Monsters, Inc. And, um, you know, it's uh, some new characters and uh, it's, it's a fun crew that's on that thing. And, you know, it's being made at Disney and, uh, and we are uh, weighing in and doing voices and talking about scripts and things like that. But it's got a great team and uh, they are um, just looking at uh, the company in a slightly different way from a uh, different lens. And uh, it's not quite been announced out there too much, but uh, the, the main character is, an in, is going to, on an in, interesting journey from just becoming part of Monsters, Inc. and then uh, taking left and right turns once he's there. And so uh, I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. Yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, it's just... great to be back in the in the studio where, which is actually my closet. It's like a Harry Potter oh. closet with sound absorbing material, and the mic, you know. And I'm there doing, and you know, just bringing that back is so much fun. Uh, you know, Roz just sucks all the fun out of any room that she's in, and uh, that's kind of fun to do. <laughs> Yeah, I do that naturally. So, and but my <laughs> voice is starting to um, get a little closer to Roz as I as I age. I've done her so much that I, hey, morning, you know, I sound like that a little bit. You're morphing into Roz. Morphing into Roz. <laughs> Yeah, um, just to circle back here as we finish out, um, the last episode of Forky Asked the Question was released in January, so there's 10 episodes there. Are there more in the works? Do you know? I don't know. Uh, I'm off on another project at the moment, uh, and I'm pondering that, what, what, it would, what that would look like. Um, for the moment, no, but you never know. And uh, I, I enjoyed working on them, and my crew did. So, uh, you know, I could see it happening eventually, but I'm, I'm getting through what I'm on now, uh, which will take a little while. And then, then, I'll, then I and Disney Plus and Pixar will call it whether we're going to go for a few more. Fair enough. I'll take I it. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I think the people want it. The people want more Forky. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so um, yes. They'll storm my house with pitch sporks instead of forks you know just say we want more. i like it it's sporks <laughs> yes well thank you so much bob for your time today and congrats again on the emmy nomination thank you for having me and yeah very excited uh for the emmy nom and uh cross the fingers yes and for those of you watching hit like and subscribe for more interviews just like this and head to goldderby.com to make your emmy winner predictions mm -hmm.